Hi, everyone, and welcome to No Dumb Questions Astrology Edition. I have my friend Tyloo Moat here, who is here to help me uh, answer a question that came in um, about the procession of the equinoxes, quintessentially. Um, there are um, arguments about different forms of astrology and, you know, are you an Aries? Are you a Taurus? Where in the, where in the sky is the Zodiac sort of a thing? And so we're just going to jump right into it. Um, I'm going to share um, some graphics in a minute, but Tal, if you want to introduce yourself and then um, just dive right in. Hi, I'm Tal Lumot. Uh, I am a rabbi's husband and father of daughters and practitioner of many lineages, one of which is a traditional Hellenistically informed uh, Mesopotamian astrological lineage. And I do readings for clients and uh, I've written a lot about astrology and the meaning and philosophy of astrology and the like spiritual implications of astrology and the interaction between astrology and religion and all of those sorts of things. And this is one of my favorite groups of astrology questions. Awesome. So a uh, question came in and um, basically it was, you know, why do people say the sun is in Gemini when in some um, zodiacs or some constellations, the sun is in cancer? Like, how do you reconcile the two? And so that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to share my screen and we will look at this. So this will be Tal's first prompt to kind of um, start this, uh, this episode. Right. So this the, the reason why this comes up for so many people is that especially pra practicing astrologers who don't know how to answer this question is that it feels like sort of the ultimate gotcha question about mm -hmm. astrology because tropical astrology is predominant in let's call it the west in the world descended from the like european like groups of cultures uh, and the uh, astronomers out there will have you know that the constellations whose names are shared by the signs of the zodiac are no longer in those signs. So how can that be? Astrology is all wrong, etc. cetera. Right. Uh, so uh, I'm a practitioner of tropical astrology. Uh, Krista, I believe, is also mostly a practitioner of, of, yep. of tropical. I would say I'm mostly a practitioner of tropical astrology. Um, what does it mean to be mostly a practitioner of tropical astrology? <laughs> well, let's talk about it. The, the difference between tropical and sidereal zodiacs is a matter of perspective. The tropical perspective is fixed from points on Earth, mm -hmm. and the sidereal perspective is fixed from points in the sky, specifically the background of stars, because those appear to be much more to be fixed in place as mm -hmm. at, while the while the axis of the Earth proceeds through the sky at a rate of one degree every 72 years or so due to the wobble of the of the earth it's not none of these things are perfect geometric realities this is this is reality that we're talking about this yeah. is the material world and so there are margins and things are fuzzy and so for for the just because the earth is tilted it the, these fixed points on earth from which these tropical signs are measured move in the sky so People will point to the names of the signs and they'll be like, clearly those, those are named after those constellations, which are up there. Mm -hmm. If this, if this tropical Zodiac is moving away from those signs, then how could it possibly work? So there's, a, there's a few illusions that we need to talk about. I think before we talk about the difference between these Zodiacs, one is the illusion that the sky is fixed in place and that the earth is, is moving through it. First right. of all, those stars are not those stars are moving at different rates in different directions. Mm -hmm. It's they're moving at speeds that are imperceptibly slow compared to the motions of the planets in our solar system, for example. But like in a million years, those constellations will be a different shape. Yeah. So, th th so that's not fixed. That, and then the other thing about constellations is that they are also illusions created by the perspective <laughs> of looking up at the sky right. from the ground on Earth. Those stars are randomly distributed throughout space. Like there are there are very few places in the entire universe where those patterns of constellations look like that. Yeah. And if you were at one of those stars in the solar system of one of those stars, you would have no idea which other stars around you were in the constellation with you because those yeah. are all just stars you can see from Earth. So these are all matters of point of view, mm -hmm. which is how astrology is done. Where do you want to reckon the unit of measurement 
that we use in astrology, which is the zodiac of 12 signs of 30 degrees? Do you want to pin it to a star for the purpose of referencing the perspective of the stars as the eternal background, eternal looking background of space? Or do you want to pin it to a place on the ground, where which is pinning it to the perspective of looking up at the sky from the ground? Yeah. And seeing how the sun and its and its planets like move through the sky year after year. And tropical astrology is a practice of doing the latter, of using the tropics, these points on the earth that sort of mark the limits of the passage of the sun through the sky over the course of the year as the measuring point. And thousands of years ago, when these things were all written down, those constellations that are on the names of the tropical signs fell more or less in those signs. And so that's where those signs got their names. But so as like, we know, so like the okay. Tropic of Cancer up here, like yeah. that, that is a point and the Tropic of Capricorn, that is a point. And like, at, you know, a long time ago, they mostly aligned, but at this point, if it's, if it's one degree every 72 years, it's been a very long time since this Mesopotamian Hellenistic astrology has been observed there has been quite a different um, movement, you know, through space. And that's why there's that, th that's why there's that kind of difference. Um, but just to kind of bring it, it's like, this is summer solstice. This is this point um, from our perspective. And I think it's key of, you know, the way when you look at this, whether it's from the sidereal perspective or the tropical perspective, it's from a perspective, you know, um, the, an article that you had sent me, uh, Ryan Butler, he kind of described it as like, you know, measuring it with um, different forms of measurement, you're getting, you know, you can have different numbers, but you're measuring the same amount of distance, you know, you can get information that looks like it doesn't reconcile, but measuring something in kilometers versus miles, you know, it's, it's just looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah, that's right. And degrees are a unit of measurement and, and 30 degree segments are a unit of measurement. And they're all geometrically idealized abstract structures that we can use to make observations more precisely in the sky. Yeah. And like you're saying, you know, thousands of years ago, when these methods were being developed, the summer solstice, the sun was at a point that was like, roughly at the beginning <laughs> of the constellation cancer. Right when it reached the summer solstice, which is an, which is a maximum like that, that, that it, that the sun reaches every year mm. that the behind it was the constellation cancer. The other illusion though, that we have to talk about, and I think you have graphics to this effect is that those constellations are not 30 degrees across. Right. There are 13 <laughs> constellations that fit in the ecliptic plane and they're all different sizes. So even if you use a sidereal zodiac that is pinned to a specific star, for example, which is, mm -hmm. and there's many, they're called ayanamshas in the Vedic astrology and the unbroken tradition of using sidereal zodiacs in India, there are lots of different ways of, of stars of, uh, to pin the sidereal zodiac to, and none of them line up perfectly with those constellations. Right. So they're all idealized. A sidereal zodiac is, is idealized. A tropical zodiac is idealized. The names of the signs come from the constellations that were behind them. But as we know, as anybody who learns how to do traditional astrology knows, signs can be defined in all kinds of ways. And certainly the stars that fall in those signs are one way of understanding like the energy of that time. But also the in for tropical astrology, the season on earth when the sun is in that sign is a, is a good way of understanding that energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what tropical astrology does. It pins the, the zodiac to the seasons. And also, you know, the triplicities and the, the other minor dignities, like the signs can be in the, you know, like, uh, I mean, the modalities, like they're, they're, the signs have all these qualities that sort of add up to a characteristic that we could describe as Leo, mm. but, but the constellation Leo doesn't give it that meaning. I mean, it, it like it, like it, it, it may have given it that meaning at one time, but that's not the only way that we understand what's happening in a sign. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's our experience from our in, incarnate existence in that space and time during that season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's like isolated receiving information from a cluster of stars you know, doesn't inform and give us all of the archetypal meanings. It's like, what is a synchronicity? It's just a moment that you imply meaning on top of, right? So it's, it's coming away from, 
um, just the, the data point. And in, in preparing for this, it was funny that Plato's cave kind of like surfaced mm. up and was like, hey, can you talk about me a little bit? But <laughs> the the ultimate end of it is like, if you know the, the allegory of the cave, at the very end, it's like, is it is it the liberation from realizing that the shadows themselves aren't the thing, but mm. it's like the, 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 the spiritual freedom to kind of come away from the materialism and into the, the, the spirit of it all. Like to me, that's kind of what, how I practice tropical astrology is, is that it, it is leaving the cave and appreciating it, but also not pretending that I'm bound by the, the shadows that I am chained to. That's, that's kind of what, what came up. So thanks. That's Plato. very nice. And, and, and it leads to sort of the question that I think is usually implied when somebody is asking like, which is better tropical or sidereal or like, how, like is tropical astrology fake or whatever it is. The question is wh which system should I use? Mm. And that should is like this, like restrictive force that people feel people feel like there's a dogma that they that they are subject to in how to practice astrology correctly quote unquote right. and and the truth is with zodiacs or with any other technique you have to have a rationale you have to understand why your approach works the way that it does mm -hmm. but your your rationale can only be grounded in your own perspective so the question of which, whether to use, let's say, a tropical zodiac versus a sidereal zodiac is, I mean, leaving aside all questions of like lineage and culture and tradition and like what your teacher taught you and all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. If you don't have any of those resources and you're starting from zero trying to figure out what the best kind of astrology to do is, think about what whether the question first of all think about the question at hand don't mm -hmm. think about astrology or the abstract as like a like a thing that always works a certain way think about what it is like what does the chart that you're thinking about actually represent and then think about the perspective that you need on the universe to understand that question is it a, is it a perspective that takes into account the changing of the seasons and the location and and that and like pinning the zodiac to to those fixed points on earth where the seasons change can help you understand the energy of the question? Or is it like a more cosmic point of view where the the view of the seemingly unmoving stars on the like ephemeral life here down mm -hmm. on earth is the is the background of the question that you're seeking to answer. And yeah. you can get here. I don't want to terrify anyone, but you can use both. You can set <laughs> you, can, you can make both. You can put both rings on your chart, you know, yeah. like it, it's you just have to know what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, when I, um, I asked you to help me answer this question, you know, a response was like, can what the question came in? Um, it was emailed into me, but it's a question that I get, you know, fairly frequently. Um, but then you asked like, you know, hearing what the question, how the question was phrased, you can kind of extract or glean what's the motivation behind the question, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's, um, there's the, you know, the, the, the idea of like, oh, there's a 13th sign, the, mm -hmm. um, how do you say it? Ophiocus. Uh, of, of, Ophiocus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, like throwing that monkey wrench in just to see, to like trip up. And it's like, there's like what one star that's on the ecliptic, you know, from that constellation, yeah. you know, but it's just enough to kind of like, um, have this Neil deGrasse Tyson gotcha, you know, mm -hmm. astrology doesn't work because this doesn't fit into your perfect 360 degree, 12 segmented Zodiac. Um, you know, so I think understanding the motivation behind the question, you know, and it, and then it, you, for me, it's like people, most people have the desire to want to reconcile it. And it kind of cracks their brain open of like, what is astrology? How do you use astrology? Why mm -hmm. do you use astrology? And I think that that you're, you're opening up their much deeper questions of like, what are you trying to reveal through the tools of astrology? And that should inform which, which, um, which practice you should, you should study. Um, but it really kind of goes down to that kernel of the why, yes. um, I added this graphic cause this is my why, mm. like to me, it is divination. And so it, for, for my practice, like there is no wrong way to, to do it fundamentally because it is a divinatory act. It is an engagement with, with energies that are beyond me. So I don't, I don't have to defend mine or argue against yours because the, the why I'm doing it is to have a conversation and I can always be wrong because I can always engage. And so 
the why for me is magical. And so it's kind of an easy get out of jail free card because that's how I use it. Right. You know, I use it to kind of tap into things that are beyond me and I'm not bound by the, the, the shadow chains. Um, but other people might feel bound. And so I wanted to bring this question up just to kind of put it into some sort of context with each other. Um, one of the, the phrases that came up from that, um, Ryan Butler article that you put was signs are equal mathematical divisions of the ecliptic constellations are visible groups of stars. And I think that, that latching them together, people thinking of signs as constellations is kind of a place where people can start and not thinking of them as just, um, exchangeable necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I, to me, the important thing in responding to somebody who gets really attached to the concept of constellations is the cultural contingency of the constellations mm. and like that it you know it, it's it's that's one level of the contingency of constellations like the fact that different groups of people in different places on earth see different images in the sky like mm. all of those are meaningful they all contribute to the human understanding of what the those groups of stars in the plane of the solar system mean to us and we should know as many of them as we possibly can but yeah. like on that other level uh, the one I talked about earlier where like those stars are randomly distributed throughout the universe and are only visible in those shapes from here. Like that should tell you everything you need to know about how important a constellation is in the grand scheme of things. It's a way right. of finding things in the sky. It's a way of orienting yourself mm. to the sky. And that's what we have to do. That's the first step in doing any astrology and astro let's like what is let's define astrology very simply and technically as like making measurements of the changes in the sky and understanding what it means like you have to have an orientation in order to do that mm -hmm. and so choosing one is a is a is a i understand that it's like a fraught weighty decision but like you can understand the sky from any perspective Hmm. You just have to be able to inhabit that perspective. Yeah. Something, something we talked about on our on our Leo conversation a little while ago Regulus. is that from <laughs> from our point of, from our tropical zodiac yeah. point of view, we got to enjoy. Many people alive right now got to enjoy the transit of the star Regulus from the sign of Leo into the sign of Virgo. And now, like I can hear the sidereals melting down now because that doesn't make any sense because Regulus is the heart of Leo. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the thing is that is such a significant astrological event mm -hmm. and that event doesn't take place in a sidereal Zodiac. And mm -hmm. so the sidereal, you might, you might sidereal Zodiac users might say like, well, I don't register that event and that's fine. But like, do you register the spring equinox mm -hmm. as an event? Because there's no point on the trop on the sidereal Zodiac where the sun crosses a line and and it suddenly it goes from winter to spring, but that's where zero Aries is in the tropical zodiac. Yeah. The fact is, these perspectives offer different things on on the meaning of what is happening in the sky, and they're all meaningful from your own perspective on what is meaningful. Yeah, yeah. I I um just remembered that you know like in the West, there's like, if you look at the moon, a lot of times you can see like the face and the man on the moon mm -hmm. in Japan, they see two rabbits uh -huh. and like, it's like there, there's that we're both looking, we're all looking at the same moon, but like the myths that we extract, the, the meaning that we infer is very different from our perspective, you know, yeah. from our point of view. And, and, um, I think just staying kind of within that myth and being open to it is a way that you can kind of engage, um, but thank you for explaining. I wanted to ask you about Regulus because we talked about it before in the yeah. Leo Deccan episode. And to me, it, it's such a beautiful little um, nugget of, of privilege that we've had living when we're living to be able to kind of experience that transit. Mm -hmm. um, that also I think Regulus just likes that we talk about it. <laughs> no, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? I just really want to honor this question because it feels like rooted in the understanding of astronomy, which mm -hmm. I think is, or the need to understand the desire to understand astronomy. And I think that that is not a, that's an indispensable skill. And mm -hmm. like, a like there's no substitute for that drive, like the drive to really understand the sky as it actually works and the bodies that are there and how, how they interact with the bodies that are down here yeah. and, and how, how our earth 
uh, can like its own angle change ever changing angle on what's going on in the sky. Like that's where it all begins because that is what the practice really consists of. And yeah. any abstract version, disembodied version of astrology that can get into a dogma war about which measurement system <laughs> is the, is the religiously true way is, is losing sight of the ground and the sky mm. and the way that you can, and, and, and how looking at each of those things differently gives you a different perspective. And that, yeah. that's, that, that is the, the motivation, the sincere motivation behind this question, I think. And I just really want to celebrate that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, we'll end on that. Um, do you want to remind people of where they can find you if you want to be found? Sure. Uh, you can find me at taalumot.space, T-A-A-L-U-M-O-T dot space. And uh, everything you need to know is there, including my free 120 something page uh, astro guide to the astro weather for newcomers to astrology, which is sort of like an astronomy based technical fundamental course in how to do uh, like charts of the moment, which is most of what my practice is. Um, and, and even for people who already know these things like me, uh, I refer back to this document all the time to brush up. And it has, it has things like all the little speeds of the planets and the average and maximum and minimum and, all, you know, like all, all those kinds of nice references, what every planetary hour ruler is in a nice mm. little table. It's all, it's all there for you. So uh, it's all there on my website, talumo.space. Awesome. I'll put that and the direct link to that, um, the Astro Weather Guide book in the show notes. Thank you so much, Tal. And um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Krista. 